If you would, please take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. The last few Sunday nights we've been looking at some different characters in the Bible. Uh, we started with Cain, uh, the brother of Abel, son of Adam and Eve. Then we looked at Noah. Tonight we're going to consider a little bit about Abraham. But I want us to look in Hebrews chapter 11. And when, when you find your place in Hebrews 11, we're going to look in verse 8. Hebrews 11 verse 8. The Word of God tells us, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place <clears throat> that he was to receive as, and as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of the promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city that had foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of the heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of the sand by the seashore. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we come before you this evening in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Father, we pray as we look into your word that you would help us to understand it tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In this particular text, and we can go back... Uh, as in our minds back to Genesis chapter 12 where God first called out Abraham God had a plan and that plan the ultimate end of that plan was to bring Jesus Christ to this world now if you remember back in Genesis chapter 3 uh, where after Adam and Eve had sinned in the garden and God was pronouncing the judgment upon them the punishment for their sin he told the serpent, I will put enmity between your seed and her seed, and between your offspring and her offspring, and it shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now that was speaking of Christ. Christ would crush the power of sin. Christ would be bruised on the cross. Uh, there would be pain, but and there would be a sacrifice, but ultimately Christ would come one day and destroy the power of sin, redeeming us by the grace of God. We thank the Lord that we know about this and we've received this grace through Jesus Christ, but we see the plan being worked out through Scripture. That is the story of the Bible. It's not a, uh, the Bible is not a collection of different stories brought together. It is one story that we find throughout that book is the bringing of Christ to this world. And then after Christ came, it's the doctrine for the church, the doctrine about Jesus Christ uh, and what he has done and who he is. But God used Abraham. I, don't know, I do not know why God called out Abraham. I do not know why God chose Abraham above any other man to bring his son through the world. That's God's prerogative. That's his, own, that's his own sovereign right that he chose Abraham. But we know that he chose Abraham to bring forth his son to this world. And so anyway, this is through Abraham's lineage. And when God came to Abraham, he made a promise. We're going to look at three different things about Abraham. We're not going to really go through any one particular text and look through it. We just want to consider the life of Abraham. And three particular things I want us uh, to think about in this. I want us to look at the, the faith of Abraham, Abraham's faith. Then I want us to think about Abraham's faults. And then lastly, Abraham's future. But first of all, his faith. Abraham is called the father of faith. The father of the faith. A father of faith. And so in that, we, we see that he put his faith in the word of God. We see that he was a man of faith by his obedience. He believed God when God told him to go to leave his land, to leave the city where he lived, and to go somewhere else, he obeyed. Now Abraham could have had an argument with God. Abraham could have had a discussion with God and said, but it doesn't make sense for me to go over here. Why can't you do the things you want to do in my life over here? But we don't find that discussion in the word of God. We just find that Abraham went. Abraham went. 
Uh, and he went. He did what God told him to do. We see uh, his faith through his obedience and that he went where God told him to go. Can you imagine having to tell Sarah, his wife, that God has told me that we're going to move uh, hundreds of miles away from here. We're going to travel. But he hasn't told me exactly where we're going to go. He's just going to tell us that we're there when we get there. Can you imagine the faith also of Sarah to trust and obey in that as well? But we find that Abraham believed God. In fact, the Bible tells us in uh, the book of Romans that God counted his faith, his obedience, his righteousness. He trusted in the word of God. But not only did God tell him to go somewhere, God also told him that you will have children. Now that sounds well and good, but even at that time, Abraham was an old man and his wife was an old woman. But God told him he would have children and through him would be many people, would be multitudes of people, people as many as the stars of the heaven and as many of the, as the grains on the seashore. Now that sounds great, but Abraham again had no children. But you know what Abraham did? He believed God. Now we see, as we're going to look in a few minutes, he didn't always have that faith, but initially he had faith in the Word of God. He believed that God was going to do exactly what he said he was going to do. And we have been called to be a people of faith. You see, we do not believe the things that God has told us because we have physical evidence. That's not why we believe things. I do not believe in the creation story but because I can go back and I can show you dates and I can show you physical evidence that it happened in that way. That's not why we believe. I don't believe every part of the Bible because we have evidence of it. I believe the Bible. I believe in the creation story. I believe that God exists by faith. You see, our faith is a theological thing. It's something of the heart. It's not of the eyes. Faith isn't something that we always can prove. We can't prove that God uh, sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. But by faith, we believe it and we know it and we trust it. And there's nothing that can take us away from believing that. We believe it by faith. So just as God called Abraham to be a man of faith, God's called us to be a man of faith. Uh, be men and women of faith. So we see not only do we see Abram's faith and his believing and then in his, his obedience and believing what God had told him about his children, we also see his faith later on in his life where we come to Genesis chapter 22. Do you remember what happened in Genesis chapter 22? It's one of the very, not that there isn't any important parts of the Bible, but it's one of those things we need to remember. In Genesis 22 is where God came to Abraham and said, Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, Bring him on a mountain, a place I'll show you, and sacrifice him. And Abraham believed God. He obeyed God. He was a man of faith. And so he, he packed up everything that he needed. He brought his son. He took his servants, and they went to the place. And then God said, lift up. Well, he lifted up his eyes, and God said, this is the place. So Abraham told his servants to stay here. And I, I like the words that Abraham used. He says, stay here by the things, stay here by the stuff. Me and the lad will return. And so he begins to go to the place where God told him to go. And, and God shows him where it's going to be. He builds the altar. He has a fire. In fact, Isaac asked, if you remember, he said, here's the fire, here's the sacrifice, here's the wood, but where's the, where's the, sacri where, where's the sacrifice? And, and, and Abraham said, God will provide a sacrifice. And so they're there. He takes, he takes Isaac. He puts him on the altar. He has the knife raised, about to drop the knife, and all of a sudden God stops him. Abraham, Abraham, uh, I know that you, I know of your faith. And he tells him to stop. And then there's a ram caught in the thicket. And God, uh, Abraham takes the ram and, and sacrifices it instead. Abraham was a man of faith. Even taking the most dearest thing from him, he was willing to do anything God called him to do. He was a man of faith. We, we see Abraham's faith. We see his faith in his life. But not only do we see his faith, we also see his faults. Now I'm glad that the Bible doesn't just paint a pretty picture. I'm glad the Bible doesn't just show us everything right that his servants did. And the reason I'm glad that God doesn't just show us everything right his servants did is because I don't do everything right. And so if I'm going to have an example like Abraham, I like to see that he was a man of faults and he received forgiveness for them and he went back and he lived for God. But right out of the gate when God called Abraham to go, he obeyed God. He went to the land of Canaan, but then there came a famine in the land. And remember what he did? He left the land. He went down to Egypt. He lied and, and, and told Pharaoh a half-truth. He said, she's my sister. Uh, he stayed there for a little while, and then that caught up with him. A little later on, God remember God had told Abram that, that he would give him a son. 
Well, Sarah got impatient and Abram got impatient as well. And Sarah said, take my servant and, ha and marry her and have a child by her. So he did it. This was, not God's, th th this was not what God had planned for Abram at this point. But Abram did what Sarah told him to do. And you see later on, you see things going on throughout his life where Abram, we see his faults. We are sinful people. We fail on a daily basis. Even people like David in the Word of God, you can look and you can see that David, the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. David is the one who slew the giant. David is the one who penned most of the Psalms that we have to date. David was a godly man. David was a wonderful servant of God. And David committed adultery. David lied to uh, the husband and to other people. David had Bathsheba's husband killed. Now, all this doesn't seem to line up. How good David was, how, how he was a man after God's own heart, and then he did these other things. What is the deal? He was a sinner, like we're sinners. He had faults. Just like Abraham had faults, David had faults, others in the Scriptures have faults, and I am glad for our sakes that God reveals their faults to us because it's in that we see the amazing grace of God. These people in the scriptures, the ones who wrote the word of God, the ones who are participants in the word of God, they needed the grace of God just as much as we do. They wrote about the grace of God and they needed the grace of God. And that gives us hope that, yes, we're going to fall. We're going to make mistakes. We're not always going to do just what's right. And we have faults. But God forgives and God gives grace and strength for us to get up and go and do what's right again. He doesn't just cast us aside when we do wrong. He doesn't just throw us away like trash. But God is a redeeming God and He is a restoring God. And that's what He does for us in our lives. That God does miracles in our life through grace. So we see Abram's faith. Well, then we see Abraham's faults. But then we see his future. In this text we see his future. The Bible says this of Abraham that he looked for a city that had foundations whose builder and maker was God. Now that tells me something about Abraham. Abraham understood something of the promises of God. You see God told Abraham that he would have children and that he would have land and all of these things. And, and there was that part of the promise of God. There would be land and there would be physical children. But Abraham understood the deeper meaning behind the promise. There was a spiritual meaning behind the promise. He looked for a city who had foundations whose builder and maker was God. Something that was spiritual. Something that was supernatural. You see, the promises of God to Abraham, we see it was fulfilled. God gave him land. God gave him children. But God ultimately gave him one child. That was Jesus Christ. All of the promises that God gave Abraham... All of the promises that God would give Israel is fulfilled in one person, Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter. The land, the land is just a physical token. It's Jesus. Jesus is the promise. Jesus is the promise fulfilled that Christ would come. We see his future. See, Abraham couldn't exactly see what everything was going to go on. But now we're in this time and we look back and we can see that Christ was the ultimate end of the promise. But not only that, we know that Abram's future in heaven one day, that all of those who call themselves children of God by faith were also, in a way, the children of Abraham, what the Scripture teaches us. And so we know that one day we're all going to be with God in heaven. And, 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 and the, the promise of Abraham is going to be fulfilled. In your seed, Abraham, will all the, chi will all the families of the earth be blessed. And what a blessing Jesus is. What a blessing it's going to be to receive that reward in heaven. A reward that goes far beyond physical blessings. It goes beyond land. It goes beyond those things. It goes to Jesus Christ. And one day Jesus Christ is going to make all things new. Jesus Christ is going to make all things right. And Abraham is a wonderful example of a faithful follower of Christ. However, he had faults. He had faults. But through all this, we see the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus would come and Jesus would be the forgiver of Abraham's sins. And Jesus would be the forgiver of our sins. We see this through the life of Abraham. So when we study scripture, yes, we need to look at the individual stories, but we also need to look at, and, and that's called the worm's eye view. 
When we get in like, the, like in the morning service, we're going through the book of 1 Thessalonians, and we're going through it as best we can, verse by verse. That's the worm's eye view. But sometimes we need to take a bird's eye view of the Bible. And then with the bird's eye view, we might not see all the nooks and crannies, but we see the big picture. And the big picture is the gospel of Jesus Christ being worked out through his servants to the ultimate end where God will be glorified. And all of the pains that happen on earth, all of the heartaches, all of the trials will one day make sense in the light of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Why did these things happen to me? Why did this person fail? Or why did this happen? It all will make sense because our purpose for living is not for ourselves. Our purpose for living is ultimately to glorify God. And one day we'll see how that happens when everything's worked out. Amen. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Father... Lord, we come before you in the precious name of Jesus. We thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy, for loving us. Uh, Father, for giving us Jesus. Lord, we pray tonight that you would be glorified uh, through the remainder of this service, even in the business meeting. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.